good day everyone welcome to the course of structural biology again and as you all know now we are in the module of structural biology techniques i talked about what is there in the structural biology technique so i am not going to repeat those things and you probably now aware of the fact that we are discussing x-ray crystallography in this module we talked about crystallization factor to affect crystallization uh, and strategies how you could do personalized treatment to make crystallization more possible as I told the average of if you do other things perfectly only crystallization limit the success of the technique being 8 to 10 percent as optimum success it is always our focus to work on this area and increase because this is the bottleneck this is the red determining step. So, uh, again we are discussing uh, how we could increase to favor crystallization and this is a plot where free energy and polymerization are put together. Now, if you look that in this graph we have put soluble lysozyme molecule and crystal of lysozyme through an activation barrier of unstable nucleus which you have to go through. So, increasing the monomer concentration which is de designated as M pushes the equilibrium towards the product. So, this is what we want N M to M N, N M is the monomers means the protein molecules here and M N is the crystal where millions of protein molecule would be arranged in the array. Uh, we are looking at the thermodynamic equation of spontaneity of the in terms of free energy and the lesson is to crystallize a protein you need to increase its concentration to exceed its solubility. It should be over its range of solubility so that it would be going for a state we are talking about we are discussing about since last class which is very key to crystallography that is or crystallization especially supersaturation. So, force the monomer out of solution and into the crystal that is called supersaturate. Three steps to achieve supersaturation maximize concentration of purified protein you have the protein you do things so that the protein would be more concentrated. Centric on centrifugal force this is a common technique used in the laboratory you have a certain molecular weight cut off which is the cut off is always on the lower molecular weight. So, what will happen the small molecules will go out water will go out and the protein remaining would be higher in concentration. Amicant pressure it also is a different system but work on the same way here uh, it is like work in the pressure situation in centricon it is under centrifugal force. Vacuum dialysis is a easy process where you have a membrane and again following the same principle the, the solvent and uh, small molecules should be going out. Dialysis against high molecular weight PEG, PEG is polyethylene glycol, ion exchange which is a principle of chromatography and slow avoid precipitation co-solvent or low salt to maintain native set. What is talking about while you are concentrating the protein what you are doing you are taking out the small molecules that is good that is what we want, but there is a trick if you are losing more than enough small molecule like sodium chloride is you or any other salts which are balancing the ionic concentration or buffers or something the molecule which is buffering you have a high chance that your protein will precipitate. So, you have protein in lower concentration you want it in higher concentration, but in between if you go more than enough you could lose the protein your protein would be precipitated and then it would be no longer functional you would lose the whole system. So, be aware about that. 
Second step, add a precipitating agent, polyethylene glycol I talked about, pigs are very useful in crystallization, high salt concentration, ammonium sulphate, uh, sodium phosphate uh, which is sodium phosphate and sodium biphosphate and small organics like ethanol, uh, MPD, methyl pentanidol, these are uh, agents and you see polymer of ethylene glycol, the pegs, they are very useful and the number 8000, 4000 and depending on the molecular weight. The third step is allow vapor diffusion to dehydrate the protein solution. If you remember when I was talking about the history of crystallization, they have realized that crystallization is a process where you remember you have a protein in solution and you want it to be crystallized so in, in, in solid state. So, there is a phase transition and so in between your protein being in solution to precipitation there is a point and how you achieve it if you remember when I describe the process of crystallization I have shown that you have taken the protein and you have taken the reservoir solution because you mix them up the reservoir solution become half of the concentration because you mix equal amount. Now you set a drop that in the drop the reservoir solution is at less concentration so water will come from the drop to the reservoir and in the process the protein would be more concentrated the uh, reagents, the precipitants there would be more concentrated. So, it is a process of dehydration. For that, here they are talking about allowing vapor diffusion to dehydrate the protein solution. So, they have set up a condition and shown that here ammonium sulphate concentration is 2 molar in reservoir and only 1 molar in the drop as we have described earlier with time water will vaporize from the drop and condense in the reservoir in order to balance the salt concentration that means super saturation is achieved. So, there are processes hanging drop vapor diffusion, sitting drop vapor diffusion, dialysis, liquid liquid interface diffusion and micro batch. Vapor diffusion uh, it is a good method of screening large number of crystallization condition. This is what actually we use in the laboratory setups to uh, get crystals in most protein crystal in most of the uh, cases. Evaporation of water from the sample droplet accompanied by net condensation into the reservoir solution so as to equalize the concentration of the two solution. So, drop have half of the concentration. So, it dehydrate to make the concentration equal for the reservoir things in both the cases. This migration of water from the droplet results in concentration of both the protein and the precipitating agent lowering the solubility of the protein and if the condition are right inducing the formation of crystals. In vapor diffusion there are different uh, processes like hanging drop is very popular. The macromolecule and crystallizing agent equilibrate against the reservoir which is at a higher generally twice concentration than that of the drop. We have already shown the demonstration of that before. Equilibration proceed by evaporation of the volatile species water or organic solvent until the vapor pressure is the droplet equals to the reservoir. So, this is the way you set it up. It is a thermodynamically closed system as I have already told you have a glass slip you take the reservoir solution you take the protein and you put grease on the uh, on the top of this place and then put the cover slip there because there is grease it would be forming a closed system you check if it could allow any bubbles or air to pass through. Uh, if it is not, then it is a perfect system. Sitting drop is mostly like hanging drop, here the cover slip is, but here the drop is not hanging, it is not hanging from here like hanging drop. It is sitting in a place, that is why it is sitting drop. The same principle applies in the hanging drop as in the sitting drop. The difference is in the experimental setup. Why? As I told, you do not know at the end which condition it is good for crystallization. 
today you think this tomorrow you will come up with other so that's where crystallization is so difficult how to set it up you have the reservoir chamber then you fill up with the reservoir and you take the protein and then you seal the chamber and your thermodynamically closed sitting drop system is ready coming to dialysis diffusion is the random thermal movement in solution which is generally follow brownian movement that leads to the net flow of molecule from higher concentration area to lower ones until the equilibrium is reached features only small molecules are subjected to move through the membrane if you see here there is in in this uh, portion there is macromolecules and small molecules so the small molecules only migrate macromolecule stays there at equilibrium concentration of small molecule in same inside and outside the membrane so in this side and in this side small molecules concentration small molecule concentration would be same right macromolecules remains in the bag so it also help in increasing concentration examples are snake skin they are very commonly used as dialysis tube you have the snake skin it's like a parallel uh, pipe only thing is flexible and you have the clips so you put the clips in two sides and then put it on the buffer solution overnight and all and it would dialyze snake skin dialysis tubes are easy ready to use form of traditional dialysis membrane tubing composed of regenerated cellulose dialysis tubing it's supplied as an open pleated tube so you get it uh, you you have this tubings like that you put the clip here you put the clip here after the protein and buffer the protein solution this would be here and now you put it on the buffer overnight what will happen the protein molecules would remain there whereas small molecules are coming out to the solution you will see that you have the protein molecule and the small molecule here but here only the protein molecule so now the protein molecule is concentrated dialysis cassettes are more advanced form uh, they are specially good for when you have small volume and you don't want to lose your uh, protein this is as the same principle like where snake uh, skin works so dialysis cassette help facilitate the rapid and effective dialysis of sample volume yes another thing is rapid so uh, as i say this is from 100 microliter to 30 ml so especially in the small range snake skins are big and they don't work well you need the dialysis cassette they are costly the cassette design helps maximize surface area to sample volume ratio and enables excellent sample recoveries then free interface diffusion so it's alternatively called as the liquid liquid diffusion method equilibration occurs by diffusion of the crystallizing agent into the biological macromolecule volume to avoid rapid mixing less dense solution is poured on more dense crystallizing agent is frozen and protein layered on top use tubes of small inner diameter generally capillary you use capillary to reduce the convection so this is the setup you put wax to seal the two side of the capillary then you have the crystallizing solution you have the protein solution they will slowly go through and there would be effective uh, concentration difference micro batch crystallization crystallization in small drops under oil so this is under oil there is oil there is sample and there is protein solution it's generally in low volume 100 plus 100 nanoliter or 1 plus 1 microliter 
the oil prevents evaporation so when i was talking about hanging drop sitting drop they do evaporation until the equilibrium is reached and because we have no idea about where the crystal comes even the crystal comes they keep dehydrating which is not good so that is why you need these conditions uh, micro batch crystallization where the oil would make an interface where slow transition would happen and giving you another dimension to get into variation towards crystallization. This is very important phase diagram of a protein. We put protein and precipitate. You see there is clear then metastable zone then nucleation and then precipitation. So, for vapor diffusion it puts you on the metastable zone works well gentle drop is concentrated after mixing does not suit all protein ok. So, it is gentle because you set a thermodynamically closed system and slowly it works naturally that is important. For dialysis gives a lot of control you have to be patient not easy to automate. Today there is time to automation as I was talking about high throughput system and if you are thinking about that dialysis is not your choice. Then micro batch screening and you see how they are putting it, it is easy, gives better crystal in many cases especially in screening. It does not matter if the security guard at the airport puts it through the x-ray machine upside down because when you put it because of the oil layer there is no chance of the drop change its shape or position and it is cheap. So, these are the talk of phase diagram and their importance and now I am taking you towards very interesting application, application of microfluidics for simultaneous screening and optimization of protein crystallization which is kind of a crystallographer's dream. But because it is a introductory course, uh, before going to the case study what is actually happening, I would try to define what is microfluidics. If you guys do not have any idea, again I am not an expert, but I would give you points which are required and which are important why crystallographers are looking for microfluidics. So, microfluidics is a sub branch of fluid mechanics that studies the physics of fluid flow at the micrometer scale. Up to now you say I do not understand anything you told. Yes, I told microfluidics is a fluid mechanics at micrometer scale, nothing else. I am coming now. Though the same equation govern physics of large scale fluid and microfluidics, a microfluidic system has smaller features with characteristic length scale, height or width or both in micrometer. So, now I am talking unlike other fluid system which have larger dimensions. What I am saying because microfluidics is operating in micrometer range, so unlike a normal fluid in normal fluidics where you have no idea about the dimension, here the dimensions are fixed in height, in width or in both. Now I am coming to the point. Complex fluid equation reduced to simpler form because one needs to neglect the effects of turbulence and gravity. Why one needs to neglect the effect of turbulence and gravity? Because that is the first difference. If you imagine you are standing near a river or a sea and the first thing what you will see is the current. The current makes the flow turbulent or turbulence make the current either way. So, this is normal fluidics. In microfluidics this is not there, no turbulence. So, in microfluidics this is laminar. People who did not connect yet, now I am telling the thing why we love microfluidics in biology. Now think about your blood flow, 
which is the major control in biology, the bloods are flown through the vein, arteries and they are in micrometer range. So, they are also having laminar flow. So, the introduction of microfluidics have given an advantage to the model, make it more biological. Okay? Presence of fewer control variables and having similarity with biological fluid makes it easy for the medical students, practitioners and researchers to study dynamics of a given fluid flow. Until and unless microfluidics is introduced to us, we love it because the model is simpler, we do not need to remember a lot of equational factors, more importantly it is more biological fluid like. But there is more, you know even more. Another thing is when you introduce microfluidics, because of the volume of microfluidics, your instrument going into very small size and it introduced something which is called lab in a chip, sorry lab in a chip, chip. So, lab in a chip and you see these are the devices, you see the differentiation you could make in a small volume. Is it working? It is working and it is revolutionary in biological diagnostics. I will give you a very recent example of Paul Yeager and you see the thing in his hand. This is a beautiful point of care diagnostics with very fast and is very cheap to do the testing of malaria. So, microfluidics help biology to develop diagnostics. Now, probably I could have give the differentiation a microfluidic field is introducing in biology help us to make biological fluid like model, make it simple, make it smaller. But now in your question is this guy is teaching crystallography from where he just have a slide of microfluidics coming to that. So, as I told application of microfluidics for simultaneous screening and optimization of protein crystallization, I was fortunate I was doing my PhD in University of Illinois Chicago and this guy Rustem Ismagilov, he was in University of Chicago that time and he developed fluidics, microfluidics based crystal screening. So, we went to his lab and I had the opportunity to get to look at the setup. So, Ismagilov lab has pioneered the development of microfluidic technology in the field of biomedical science. One of them includes droplet based microfluidics which I am going to talk about introduce to you which is opening the new horizon in protein crystallography. This is the system you see this is the thing where you have different channels, you have re reagent A, you have reagent B, you have separating stream so that they are separated and they are mixing when the fluorinated carrier fluid is mixing there. So, there is three things reagent A let us take this is protein, reagent B let us take this is the precipitant and fluorinated carrier fluid and now they are making you know separate droplets that is why it is a droplet microfluidics. And see they are going in that way and they are separated now. So, you say drop right, but you do not need to have separate chambers like we had before in case of sitting drop or hanging drops. It is more important because see this is slow going, this is a different tube, so it is fast going. So, what you could do in this setup, you could control the conditions by varying the flow rate. So, the flow rate is in your hand, it is not manual, you have a mechanical automatic device to do that, you put one speed and you put second speed, it is easy. See here, they have different 
concentration and different speed and they got the difference here to fit. So, they have a system which could control. Now, what is the effect of controlling? Before going to that, I will come back to what I have already described the zones of crystallization. You remember the zones of crystallization, there are three zones and first zone is mostly clear and third zone is the precipitate in between nucleation happen. So, as I was talking, in the first zone there is no nucleation, you wait for long time, you get like slow nucleation and but the order is slow ordered growth. So, sometime that is good. The other one is nucleation. So, in most of the cases, lot of nucleation. So, you have first disordered growth. It is not essential that every time you get this disordered growth, sometime when the growth is actually very slow, you might get a ordered growth here, but it is not in your control. The major thing is. So, when so you, you see the difference. Now, when you look at the crystallization in capillaries, you get another advantage. Remember, I talked about when you are in this sitting drop or hanging drop, you got crystal here, but you got crystal, but equilibrium is not reached. So, the crystal would be dehydrated. That dehydration or any evaporation is not there in capillary giving another advantage. Again, remember I talked about sometime crystal takes years to develop. In that time, because of the equilibration, the mother liquor might got in a situation where it would spoil the crystallization or the crystal formed, but it become damaged. Here in capillary, because of the formation of plug, because of seal capillary, because of incubated capillary, it could be stable for a year, which is a huge time. So, in addition to the advantage of control, you also get no evaporation. So, crystals are stable once formed. Now, as I told in conventional crystallization, if you try to control, you get either nucleation or ordered growth, but it is very rare to get bo both of them. And that is why the rate of crystallization of getting proper crystal. It is not the rate of, when I say rate of crystallization, if you get a disordered crystal, you cannot do anything with that. So, you, when I say crystallization, it is a ordered crystallization, ordered growth. So, crystallization happen and ordered growth happen, it is very rare. Very interestingly here, you could have separate the nucleation and growth. See, there is a time gap. That is the most critical feature which is providing by this system, this microtita system and that is where I am saying it could revolutionize if it comes into the high throughput way. Also, you see they could see with nucleation and without nucleation. So, you could separate them and you could use both of them and they also show a case study of a real crystal where in most of the cases they got precipitation in normal conventional crystals. Even if they got clusters, they got very bad clusters you could see, but in case of microfluidic seeding you get the single crystals. The crystal looks small, so are they solvable? Yes, they have also shown that the crystal they have used for structure determination. This is a metallopeptides family M3, 
uh, and this is part of MCSG which I discussed earlier in the structural genomics, they have solved this crystal. Now, they not only limit themselves on showing the difference, they also design experiment based on classic hypothesis. And the classic hypothesis, if you go to the earlier class slides, I have already told about. But to make your memory refreshed, I have written it here. A small fraction of the protein surface is involved in crystal contacts, the rest being pretty much in solution. Which means, the for crystallization, it is the protein surface and that also small fraction of the protein surface which is needed. Smagilov group have utilized them, they have set up the system in a way so that they are mixing it and the mixing is either slow mixing or first mixing. Slow mixing means lifetime of interfaces are long and first mixing means lifetime of interfaces are short. The assumption only nucleation as I told at interfaces is important. So, what they got? They made different case studies of crystallization. One in one, they do slow mixing and first mixing using high super saturation. And if you see in slow mixing, they got no crystal or very small crystallets. But in first mixing, they got crystal. So, in this case, at high super saturation, first mixing works and you see what they did they differentiate the capillary into dif different part one where everything is mixing the oil is coming the protein is coming the salt is coming and the buffer is coming then they go through the turbulent flow where the control is in their hand they are making it either slow mix or first mix and then they again put it on the capillary steadily. Okay. So, part A, the setup have part A, part B and part C and the result you see first mixing works. So, is it that first mixing always works? Now, they develop different case study where in case of high super saturation, which was there, they are using, I knowingly wrote that so that I could change it to show you they use low super saturation. And what is the result? No crystal may mean improper mixing instead of a bad precipitate. They do slow mixing and first mixing and they got crystal in case of slow mixing. So, slow mixing works. So, that is how they have shown us that in different condition, different setup, different type of microfluidics works. And they even not limit themselves there, they go for developing. So, that is for very individualistic conditions. But then they try to develop microfluidic tools to screen protein crystallization condition. First thing they do, they use gradient screen of crystallization condition. So, what that means? That means you have ammonium sulfate as the main precipitant. You use different concentration of ammonium sulfate in that way. And uh, suppose here they take lysozyme, they take buffer, they take PEG and they take NaCl. And then they develop the differences optimal range of precipitant concentration. The precipitant, so they are showing different droplets. In some droplet, precipitants are too low. In some, some they are optimized because you get the crystal and in some they are too much. So, in that way, you know, sometime you might use the correct precipitant, but you are not using the correct concentration. Here, you could screen that. So, you could optimize the precipitant concentration using this tool. 
then the second one is even more interesting they use sparse matrix screen in nanoliter plugs so they develop different plugs of 10 nanoliter so they have the preform cartridge and they add the protein and then they have the continuation so they ha they have developed a T junction in the T junction they are mixing the protein so that every nanoliter plugs got the protein and then they could screen it according to different conditions and they also have developed a hybrid method where they combine the sparse matrix and the gradient screening so they develop the preform cartridge they have the protein flow then they have the receivery capillary but then they merge it with the different concentrations so they have this spacer plugs which differentiate the large plug of these reagents and the plug size varies with different reagent concentration so they are using plugs and each of the plugs are differentiated with different concentration of the precipitant so they optimize the nanoliters they optimize the precipitant concentration so combining two procedure further variation so as i told throughout the course of this crystallization more you come up with variation more you have chance of getting a crystal here they are developing the tool to give us the potential to make a number of huge number of variations and remember they are doing it in micro and nanoliter another big advantage remember when i talk about this process of crystallization needs a lot of protein but actually you need one concentration so you have to produce lot of protein and more protein you have more screening you could do but here you are doing in generally you do in my like milliliter range in the conventional one here you are doing microliter to nanoliter so you could do more screening because you need little amount of protein per go so here i will make summary of today's class we have understood crystallization is the major barrier towards achieving the success in protein crystallography we have studied the process of crystallizations different uh, techniques and all and factors affecting crystallization the process also we have studied our study tells us that personalized treatment towards individual protein is essential for achieving crystal we have shown you that the protein you do everything and not getting crystal with some protein engineering strategies you could have get crystal with some other strategies of ligand addition and all uh, domain you you could get crystal so personalized starts are re required and when we talk about this personalized treatment that might be critical towards making high throughput approach problematic so when people are doing high throughput you like if i say you work on a protein and do your phd you have chance to do personalized treatment think about the protein think about study about the protein surface proteins property how to compare with other proteins which have crystallized homologous proteins and all these things you could do but when i tell you you have to work with 5000 protein or 100 protein you could not get those chance so that tells us that high throughput is good for genomics but for structure it's probably not the optimized approach and then we look at microfluidics the microfluidics based system it is definitely a new hope and i sincerely hope that that would so uh, it is already showing immense potential but it would come out as a device and we could have all access to that because at the end it is not crystallization it is crystallography to solve the structure and relate it to function that's the goal our goal is to go from sequence to function that's where the structural biology is standing you all are amazing audience please uh, talk to us contact us if you have any question regarding this i'll be very happy to receive them and i will try my best to 
answer according to my accessibility. Thank you very much.